Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome. I am a Griffin. I'm a professor of modern British history here at the University of East Anglia. I'm going to be chairing and hosting this event this evening, which is the fourth in our lecture series uh, entitled After Brexit, Brexit, Utopia or Dystopia. The series being convened by my friend and colleague Hussein Khan, and it's linked to many other elements of his wider research that we've been doing over the past few decades. So projects such as Negotiating the Future, which followed the Article 50 negotiations and beyond, and his national research programme, The UK in a Changing Europe, which provides information and discussion around a wide range of contemporary issues. So the idea behind the series is really to, to go further on, I think it develops on his um, what is Brexit series from before. It's clear that Brexit has happened, but I think us here in the university, we all know that the debate about Brexit is very far from over. There is still very much to be resolved in a legal and a political sense um, in the relationship between the UK and the EU, much to be reviewed, much to be reassessed. But I think there's clearly, and speaking as a historian, there's much more about the wider and broader politics um, of Brexit that are, are still up for discussion. Uncertainty really about the nature of the relationship between the UK and its European, uh, European neighbours about state, economy, culture, politics, still very much for us to think about um, uh, uh, and to reassess a new relationship really going forward. And one of the joys of being connected with the university is it gives us space to reflect, debate and discuss these kinds of issues. So our speaker tonight is Margaret Macmillan. Margaret Macmillan is a very esteemed professor of history at the University of Toronto, an emeritus professor of international history at Oxford University. She has served as the provost of Trinity College Toronto between 2002 and 2007, and also was the warden of St Anthony's College in Oxford from 2007 to 2017. She's currently a trustee of the Central European University and of the Imperial War Museum. Her research specialises in British imperial history and the international history of the 19th and 20th centuries. Her many publications include War, How Conflict Shaped Us, Paris 1919, and The War That Ended Peace. She gave the CBC's Massey Lectures in 2015 and the BBC's Reith Lectures in 2018. Her many awards include the Samuel Johnson Prize for Nonfiction and the Governor General's Literary Award. She has honorary degrees from several universities and is an honorary fellow of the British Academy. She is also a companion of the Order of Canada and a companion of honor of UK. So she's gonna to speak to us tonight for 45 minutes. The lecture looks at Britain and the British empire as a global hegemon in, in late 19th and early 20th centuries. She's gonna be looking at the disappearance of empire and the legacies of that disappearance on British thinking and policies and what global Britain may mean today. And I'm sure you can um, join me in thinking this is going to be a fascinating contribution to understanding and under, uh, unpacking uh, the, the, the Brexit moment that we're living in today. So over to you, Margaret. Thank you so much, Professor Griffin. And thanks to the University of East Anglia for having me to speak. I only wish I were there um, in Norwich, but here we are, we've, we've all got used to zooming this way and that. I want to explain why I'm taking a historical approach um, to the question of what happens after Brexit. Brexit. Will, there, will there be a utopia or a dystopia or perhaps something in between? And that's because I think history can be helpful. And I think in the whole debate over Britain's place in the world, which was part of the debate over Brexit and the whole debate over Brexit itself, many themes have come up which have been there throughout British history. What is interesting, I find, is that the very term Global Britain hasn't in fact been that used, used that much, although as we'll see, many of the elements in what makes up Global Britain have been used and are still being used and I think will be used in the future. I don't know how many of you have discovered um, something that Google offers called Ngram, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, it can be a tremendous waste of time. But what you can do is use the giant Google database of all the books that they digitized and articles they digitized and search for certain words or search for certain combinations of words. And so a few days ago, I thought I'll look up Global Britain and see 
where it appears. And I found it absolutely fascinating. There is virtually nothing, there is virtually no reference to global Britain before about 1938. And then it begins to slowly, slowly rise. And so from 1938 onwards, as the international situation got worse and as Britain moved into the Second World War, during the Second World War itself and after the Second World War, there were more references to global Britain, not all that many. It's only in about 2011 that mention of global Britain really takes off. And if you do it for yourselves, just put in global Britain, you have to use a capital B because this particular one is very sensitive to cases. And you will see it suddenly goes up. By the time of the 26th referendum, use had increased eightfold since 2011, by 2019, 13 fold. And I think that says something about the sort of arguments that were being made around the referendum and the ways in which I think, particularly by supporters of leave, the notion of a global Britain was used more and more as justification for Britain to leave the European Union. It's become, I think, also a post facto justification for Brexit. In other words, once the vote had been done, once that long and very difficult process of disentangling Britain or the United Kingdom from the European Union had begun and had become much more complicated, I think, than many people had expected, as it became clear that the European Union was not going to roll over or fall into pieces with different countries negotiating separately with the United Kingdom, the notion of a global Britain, I think, became more and more important as a justification for having this attempt, um, a successful attempt by now, of course, to leave the European Union. The European Union was, was posited as a, an anchor, a tie, a confining force on this global Britain, which was going to spring free of the European Union and resume its rightful place on the world's stage. And you can see this, I think, in the frequent statements the government and other leaders of the Leave campaign have made since the referendum of 2016. Um, in 2018, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office brought out a collection entitled Global Britain, delivering on our international ambition. In the same year, Theresa May, then Prime Minister, made a speech at the Munich Security Conference, which brings together leaders from many of the, of the democracies and others. This is what she said. We are a global nation, enriching global prosperity through centuries of trade, through the talents of our people, and by exchanging learning and culture with partners across the world. And a frequent theme that has come up is not just that Britain is global because of its interest, because of its trade, because of its history, but it's global because it is a global value giver. Britain gives to Brit gives to the world values, um, promotes values in the world which, which are good for the world. Um, David Frost, who is responsible in the cabinet for EU relations, has talked about the United Kingdom as being one of the key rule setting powers along with the European Union, the United States and China. In February 1920, Prime Minister Boris Johnson made a speech in the Painted Hall at Greenwich saying how very healthy and how very important the, the decision to leave had been. He said, and I quote, just as the glorious revolution settled long and divisive political questions about who sits on the throne, Brexit has been the same. This is the newly forged United Kingdom on the slipway. And so I think global Britain has taken on a particular meaning. Of course, there have been critics. Not everyone has shares this vision of a global Britain which sets values, which has a glorious past, which has brought so much to the world. Another view of global Britain is that expressed by David Olusaga, among others, as a predatory power, exploiting and benefiting from the profits of trade, from the slavery of human beings and cheap labor of others, from the exploitation of resources. And here I will quote again David Olusaga from an article in Prospect magazine in December 2019. When the British flag was lowered across the quarter of the world that had once been pink, an empire of territory and domination was replaced by an empire of delusions, a fantasy realm upon which the truth never rises. When the inglorious chapters of the imperial story, slavery, the Indian famis, famines, genocide in Tasmania, are forced into the national conversation, they are relativized away. After all, was British rule not more benign than that of the Belgians in the Congo? Was it not less brutal than that imposed on Namibia by the Germans? And so the notion of global Britain is very much tied up 
with the past and, and how different peoples and different groups in the United Kingdom see the past. And I think there's a third component to global Britain, which of course is right here in Britain. Um, you've had for centuries people from the world coming to live in Britain, partly because of Britain's connections with that world. I'm Canadian, many Canadians moved to Britain, and the movement of peoples did not only ever go one way. And in the composition of the British population today, you can see just how important those global connections were in the past. The presence of people whose ancestors came from Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. These are all testaments, I think, to this very complex relationship on many levels that the United Kingdom or Britain has had with the rest of the world. What global Britain means is something that draws, of course, on the past and, and the relationship of Britain, the United Kingdom, to the world has had a great many different aspects. Um, indeed, just to make it complicated, these islands have had a great many different names. People have talked variously of England, as they tended to in the 16th century, Great Britain, as they did after the Act of Union, the United Kingdom, as they did also by the 17th century. I'm wondering now if we may be reverting back to talking of England again, um, with the possibility of Scotland and Northern Ireland facing perhaps different futures, but that's perhaps a topic for another lecture. What are these elements? Well, they are variously everything from geography to culture. Some are more important than others in certain periods. They change over time. And of course, they're affected by changes both here in the British Isles, but also in those parts of the world which the British Isles have been interacting with. Clearly, geography and sea power have played a very important part in obliging the British Isles to, to look outwards rather than inwards. Um, it has insulated them perhaps from some of the outside world, but it's also been a way in which they have been able to travel out. We should re recognize, I think, that the British Isles have never, at least since classic times, been insulated from a wider world. They were part of the Roman Empire. Even before they became part of the Roman Empire, the upper classes in these islands were already becoming Romanized in their tastes, in their attitudes, um, already beginning to trade with Rome. We tend to see, and I think this has been the case perhaps in more recent history, we tend to see the channel as a barrier. But for much of history, it was a highway. It was much safer and much easier to travel by water than by land. And so through water, the British have been able to reach out. And of course, the more they learned about navigation, the more they developed the technology to navigate around the world and the knowledge to navigate around the world, the more that ease and uh, habit, habit, the habit of, of using the seas, benefited from them. It's also, of course, economic. The British from these islands have gone out to look for goods that the population wants. They've gone out to look for profit. They've gone out to invest their money. It also, of course, the relationship with the world has also been due to technology. It, the capacity to travel around the world, the development of improved steering mechanisms, the development of the compass, the ability to navigate by the stars, all this meant that it became possible to go further and further. And it also became possible to map where you were going and bring that knowledge and share that knowledge with others who wanted to travel out. We've also seen, of course, as a part of global Britain, the movements of peoples that I referred to earlier, certainly in the 19th century, but even before people from these islands were traveling out to Europe, but then around the world, literally millions of people had left these islands by the beginning of the 20th century. And as I mentioned before, there was also the reverse migration peoples coming in. Britain has also been global, or the British Isles have also been global in the sense of participating in global tastes, being influenced by what is happening in a wider world, from foods, things that the British take as a standard part of their diet today, from tomatoes to peanuts, of course, were not known before the 16th century. Tobacco, all these came from the New World or, or came from Africa. Fashions have traveled outwards from Britain, ideas, styles, but they've also traveled inwards. Part of what has made up global Britain too has been what you might want to call the um, idealistic side or, or the ideological side. Um, perhaps ide ideology is, is a better world. Uh, the idea that somehow the British Isles and, and perhaps the um, United Kingdom in particular have been able to offer institutions, ways of doing things, ideas to peoples around the world. 
And this is often, of course, led to a sort of arrogance that the ways of this I these islands are better than the ways of the benighted peoples who live around the world. Um, often it has meant that people here in government, people in the elites, have assumed that they have a right to intervene in the affairs of other peoples, even on the other side of the globe. An absolutely classic statement of this, I think, and again, I'm going to quote, it's from Lord Palmerston in a debate in Parliament in 1850. This was the debate over a Portuguese subject called Don Pacifico, who was living in Athens, who also happened to be a British subject. He had claims on the Greek government because a mob, which included um, the son of the Prime Minister of Greece at the time, had burnt down his property. And the British government had decided to take up the claims of Don Pacifico, I think for its own reasons. It had other reasons for wanting to put pressure on the Greek government. And Palmerston in that debate, and he was attacked by those who said Britain should not be intervening in the affairs of Greece, should not be supporting the claims of someone who had a, a complaint against the Greek government, Palmerston asserted the rightness of Britain, not just the right, but the rightness of Britain in defending Don Pacifico. He said of British values and British principles, and I'll quote again, I'm convinced these principles are calculated so far as the influence of England may be properly exercised with respect to the destinies of other countries to conduce to the maintenance of peace, to the advancement of civilization, to the welfare and happiness of mankind. And of course, by the 19th century in particular, this particular view of Britain, sustained as it was by an increasing trade work network, sustained as it was by increasing technology and, and ease of travel around the world, was overlapped with and reinforced by the notion of empire. The role of the British Empire in helping to create a view of a global Britain, of course, is enormously important. Earlier on, David Olasagre, in, in the quotation from, from the article that he wrote, talked about the pink on the map of the world. And it was something that every British school child, certainly before about 1945, grew up with. And we grew up with it too in Canada, where I was educated. We were shown a globe which was colored pink. And this was something that was meant to be part and said to be part of Britain's greatness. The sun, it was said, and we were reminded of it frequently, never sets on the British Empire. Well, this is not something, this relationship and these attitudes and, and the ways of thinking about the wider world is not something that, of course, is static. And it's changed partly in response to changes within the British Isles, but also, of course, in response to changes around the world. And often, of course, what we've seen is a certain idea of a global Britain, a certain idea of empire, which has come right up against reality. And sometimes the British, as they think about the outside world, have been forced to change. There's always been a tension, and I think we see it today, between what the United Kingdom would like to do or, or Britain would like to do and what it is possible to do. And there have been moments, and I'll talk about some of them, where this has been rather rudely challenged, this idea that Britain can do exactly what it wants when it has become quite clear that indeed it can't do what it wants. The relationship of Britain, and I, I won't belabor this point, but was developed slowly over time. Um, early on in the 16th and 17th centuries in the age of exploration, the interest of the, those who sailed out from the British Isles was in discovering new routes to the east, exploring new parts of the world, sheer curiosity, trying to find out what lay over the horizon. But it was also, of course, almost from the beginning about profit. A number of the early exploratory voyages were made by companies, joint stock companies that invested in ships, invested in the captains, invested in the men who went out and sailed around the world and hoped to find profit. Um, there were profits to be made from bringing back new products, things such as spices, which were in high demand, sugar from the far off parts of the world. And the push to find routes out to the Far East was encouraged and, and pushed on by the fact that the land routes through Central Asia and then into the Ottoman Empire were becoming more and more difficult. And so there was always a strong economic incentive for the British Isles to push out into the world. Not all that many people, it seems to be the case among the well-to-do landed classes in the 16th and 17th centuries were caught by either the desire for profit or the excitement of exploration. And there was, I think, less sense, certainly in those centuries, 
that the British or the English had superior values, which somehow should be a model for the rest of the world. There were always exceptions, of course. There were the militant Protestants who believed that souls needed to be saved, not just for Christianity, but saved from the Catholics who were themselves, of course, in the shape of, of Spanish and French explorers and, and colonists trying to save souls, um, moved by, by hostility to Spain. But I think what you saw in the early parts of the expansion, the 16th and 17th centuries, was the opening of a sensibility among the English and, and to a lesser extent, I think, among the Scots and the Welsh, that the British Isles were not just a part of Europe, but they were, in fact, part of a much wider world. Once the routes to the Americas were opened up, once the routes to the Far East were opened up, then Britain began increasingly to conceive of itself and certainly parts of the elites began to conceive of themselves as part of a world order rather than simply a European, uh, a European order. Um, by the 18th century, the British who were going out were beginning to put down roots. Not that they necessarily wanted to, but if you're going out to trade, you have to establish some warehouses on land, you have to establish relationships with people on land. And so gradually, if you look at the maps, the British began to establish posts around, for example, the coast of the subcontinent. They began to establish posts in Asia. They began to establish posts along the coasts of, of North, the east coasts of, of North America. And what happened, and I think the Chinese are finding very much the same thing today, is that they got drawn into local politics. They may have come for profit, but in order to safeguard those profits, in order to safeguard the trading routes which led into the interiors, they found themselves more and more drawn into local politics. And so in India and in the Americas, um, those who are coming out from the British Isles found themselves increasingly becoming part of local politics and increasingly their influence and their settlements began to spread out. Um, and as I say, I think the Chinese are finding rather the same thing in uh, today. The Seven Years' War, fought in the second half of the 18th century between the British and the French, I think can be described truly as the first global war. It was a war that was fought in India, fought in the East, but also fought in the Americas, fought in the West Indies, fought in Canada, fought off, well, what became Canada, and fought, of course, at sea. And so you begin to get the foundations being laid for what was going to be the tremendous expansion of the 19th century. And what made that tremendous expansion possible was, of course, huge technological changes. The Industrial Revolution, the introduction of steam, which made sailing much more predictable, uh, made it much easier to move around the world, the introduction of railways on land, the introduction of the telegraph, which began to link the world in a communications network. I think as great an innovation in its own way as the internet today, um, because it brought a world together in ways that it had not been before, and it brought it together so that news spread almost instantaneously around the world. Europe itself, of course, was changing in other ways. The emergence of increasingly nationalistic states, the spread of public participation, the spread of literacy, all meant that outward events, external events, were no longer just something that small elites or a few people were concerned with. Increasingly, they became things that larger and larger publics were concerned with. What you also got by the 19th century was a shift in the attitudes to other peoples. In the 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, when people from the United Kingdom encountered indigenous in Canada, in the, in the Americas, and encountered um, the peoples of the Mughal Empire and the other independent Indian company, in Indian nations in, in, in the subcontinent, or when they encountered um, the Chinese Empire, they did so very much often as supplicants, not with a particular sense of superiority. In fact, for much of the period up until the 19th century, Europeans, and it was true of, of other Europeans as well as of, of the British, going out around the world, did not see themselves as superior. In many cases, they were overawed by the magnificence of what they saw. And you can see it in the writings of some of the early Jesuits who went to places like China, they, they went and they were overawed by the learning, by the knowledge, by the organization of the Chinese empire. And it was only really, I think, in the 19th century that this sense of superiority began to develop. And it developed, I think, 
partly because of what was happening in Europe. It developed because Europe was briefly in the history of the world taking off. It was briefly superior to other nations in terms at least of weaponry and in terms at least of technology. And this began to affect the way in which Europeans, and you can certainly see it in the case of those people who lived in the United Kingdom, began to affect the ways in which they regarded others. Instead of regarding those whom they encountered as peoples who might have different habits and customs, but sometimes often superior or perhaps better ones, they now began to weave a story with this element of, of technological superiority, um, which increasingly included an element of moral superiority that it wasn't just European technology, it wasn't just European guns, it wasn't just European gunboats that were better than those they encountered in other parts of the world. The Europeans themselves began to persuade themselves that they were, in fact, superior. And so increasingly, the attitude which made up the thinking and the behavior of people from the British Isles towards the world with which they were dealing was one of superiority. Um, sometimes it was based, sure, but I'd say a lot of it was, was purely racist, um, that you know, you've got a whole development of a whole set of theories fueled by, I think, a misappropriation of Darwinian theories about evolution, about different species, that there were different species in the world, um, in the human world, and that some were superior to others and that some were condemned always to be behind. And so you've got a twist, a new type of thinking about the world, which came to have if not completely dominated by, but came, certainly came to have a very strong racial element, which had not been present there so much in the period before the 19th century. Now, not everyone felt like this, and indeed not everyone in the British Isles was caught by the glamour of Britain in a global world, not caught by the glamour of the empire. Um, there were those who rather cynically said that the empire was something that appealed to a certain class it appealed to the elites, um, as James Mill said. James Mill said it gave them jobs for their children. He described the British Empire as a vast system of outdoor relief for the upper classes. A lot of people in the British Isles were indifferent to empire, and I think it's striking, actually, if you look at the literature of the 19th century, how relatively little there is about the empire. I mean, you get occasional nabobs, in, in such as Josh in Vanity Fair, who comes back from India with a fortune made in, in some nameless but no doubt corrupt way. You get very few mentions of empire in, in Jane Austen. You get the occasional thriller by Wilkie Collins where mysterious peoples travel from the east. But for a lot of people living in the British Isles, the empire was something that happened somewhere else and didn't particularly affect them. It was always said that when the question of the government of India came up in the House of Commons, it was a sure thing to empty the house. Um, people were simply not all that interested. Well, the British found themselves, whether they wanted to or not, as the heart of a great global network. And what they found increasingly was that much as they saw themselves, or many saw themselves as, as, a, as a dominant part in this great global network, increasingly they were being challenged. They were being challenged by other powers, powers that were beginning to try to build their own empires, or powers that in the case of the United States were beginning to compete with the British for markets and for investments around the world. And what they increasingly found also is that parts of the empire were beginning to develop their own views, beginning to develop their own wishes, um, which of course they'd already always had, but beginning to mobilize themselves politically. It happened in different, different times and in different parts of the British empire, but it began to happen early on in, in my own country, Canada, where you got local pressures by the 1830s for responsible government. Um, the colonists no longer willing to do what they were told by people sent out from London, but wanting a share in their own government. And increasingly in India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, you got a broad, increasingly broad-based nationalist movement by the time of the First World War, which was pushing for more and more a greater share. There was much discussion both in Britain and, and elsewhere about what this meant and, and about how Britain might shift in response to these pressures. There was talk of trying to build a unitary empire with possibly a single bureaucracy, possibly a single parliament. Um, there was something called the Round Table Movement, which, which tried to bring the different parts of the British Empire into some sort of 
political and bureaucratic unity. But in fact, there was increasing resistance from the members of the empire themselves. What was also happening, of course, was that the British were themselves developing, um, as they always had, very mixed feelings about their position in the world, particularly again the empire, which was so much a part of a global Britain in, the, in this period. There had always been criticisms, always been commentaries from within Britain about Britain's relationships with the world, and there were many who found empire to be a very bad thing. They felt that it perverted um, British character. They felt it was a bad thing for the British to be dominating other peoples. They felt, with some re justification, that the British were exploiting others and that this was bad on, on, on all counts. Um, some of the most severe critiques of Britain and its empire and Britain's position in the world came, in fact, from within the British Empire. But of course, they were going to be taken up and expanded greatly um, in other parts of the world. The First World War saw Britain certainly as a global power, but it left it, if, if not apparent at first, it left it seriously weakened. The older parts of the British Empire, Canada, um, the colonies in Australia, began to push for greater and greater independence within the British Empire, and many of them began, I think, peoples there began to see themselves as one day becoming fully independent. And importantly, the First World War also showed that Western civilization, British civilization, was, was not superior. One of the great spurs to nationalist movements in parts of, of the world, such as Asia, in Africa, was the experience of those soldiers, a million soldiers from India, soldiers from Africa, soldiers who had come from around the world to fight in France. It was their experience of seeing the often the incompetence and the lack of leadership of those they had been told were somehow for, of a superior civilization. And so many of those who had fought in Europe for one or other of the great empires, including the British Empire, went back to their own countries and became active in nationalist movements. A very important psychological shift took place. Not, I think, that the British always recognized it, but slowly, much as many disliked it, particularly in the upper classes, the British began to have to concede greater and greater self-government to more and more of their empire. And I think they also began to become aware uneasily that what had sustained their global position, the power of their economy, um, their huge military capacity, to their huge capacity to project power around the world was no longer what it had been. Um, they began to feel what Paul Kennedy, the English historian, has called imperial overstretch. And they began to find the burden of empire was beginning to weigh very heavily, particularly, of course, as they confronted a worsening situation near at hand in Europe and a parallel worsening situation happening in Asia with the rise of Japan and the growing hostility between Japan and the Europeans and the United States. The Second World War, again, saw Britain as a global power, but again was going to undermine many of the foundations on which that global power rested. The British fought very bravely and with the help of the empire after France had fallen, but when the United States entered the war and became more and more involved both in Europe and the Pacific, the British increasingly took second place. They increasingly had to borrow from the United States. They increasingly had to rely on the United States. And what the Second World War saw, although again, not everyone realized at the time, was a shift in power, financial power, military power, world power, away from Britain and the British Empire towards the United States and the other, of course, great superpower, uh, superpower of the Soviet Union. Churchill continued to maintain that he was not going to preside over the dissolution of the British Empire, and the British continued to see themselves as a global power. But as I said earlier, increasingly that came up against reality. And there were going to be, I think, seven certain key moments in this after 1945. Um, the British began to realize that they could no longer maintain the role that they had maintained. In 1947, for example, as they tried to withstand Soviet pressures, both in Greece and Iran, they were forced to call on the United States because the British could no longer bear 
that burden. Churchill had a view that Great Britain would be at the center of three concentric circles of power, the United States, Europe, and the Empire Commonwealth, but in fact, those began to shift and alter. I think the special relationship was something that was particularly seen on the British side as helping to maintain Britain's global power. It has never been seen as that by the United States. In 1949, the great scientist, um, Henry Tizard, said, we are not a great power and never will be again. We are a great nation, but if we continue to behave like a great power, we shall soon cease to be a great nation. Let us take warning from the fate of great powers of the past and not burst ourselves with pride. It was, I think, a very good warning. And I think much of the history of Britain's relationships with the world since 1945 has been the clash, as I mentioned earlier, between that attempt to behave like a great power um, coming right up against reality. Uh, there have been, of course, and still are attempts to compensate for Britain's lessening global status. The Commonwealth, it was hoped, would become a sort of vehicle to replace the empire. But in fact, although it has done much valuable work in, in sharing poverty alleviation measures, sharing health measures, it's never become a powerful political organization. Um, the British placed great emphasis on their independent nuclear deterrent, which I've always thought was more symbolic than actual. As Ch Churchill believed and said in 1945, having nuclear weapons is the price we pay for sitting at the top table. It has been a considerable price, and in the end, the British have had to rely on American submarines to deliver their nuclear deterrent, and they've had to rely on American technology. Um, there have been various attempts also to promote the soft power of Britain as a global force. Um, Tony Blair talked about cool Britannia. Um, there have been attempts to promote British values abroad. There have been hopes placed in the power of the monarchy um, as something that people around the world look to. And there have been attempts made, and I think still are, to use the family ties that once existed more than they did perhaps now between the British Isles and, and peoples around the world. As Anthony Eden said in 1952, our thoughts move across the seas to the many communities in which our people play their part in every corner of the world. These are our family, this is our life. But again, reality has, I think, come in to disrupt this rather optimistic picture. The United States has shown that it has looked after its own interests, not those of the British. It reneged on the nuclear sharing deal after the Second World War, British technology had helped to de develop the American bomb and the United States had benefited from that, um, had promised to share nuclear technology and didn't. Um, Suez, I think, was a crucial moment when the British and the French in collusion with Israel tried to seize the Suez Canal and the Americans were absolutely furious. They threatened to pull all their, their, their they threatened to pull their support for the pound. The Commonwealth split um, at a, a motion in the General Assembly brought by the United States demanding a ceasefire. Only Australia and New Zealand voted with France and Britain. Canada certainly did not. The empire disappeared very, very quickly. And as Dean Acheson, the American Secretary of State, said, I think pointedly, and I think it's something which I think we still recognize, Britain has lost an empire and not yet found a role. It's trying to play, he said, a separate role apart from Europe based on a special relationship with the United States, being head of a commonwealth, which, said Acheson, has no political structure, unity, or strength. This role is about played out. Successive British governments have recognized this but I think the pressure of history, the, the glamour, the light shed by the past has sometimes beguiled them into thinking that yes, Britain can still exercise power in a global way as it has done in the past. Um, the Falklands, I think, which were a complete surprise to the British government, I think, the Falklands seemed for an instant to show that Britain was still capable of projecting its power around the world. Tony Blair's government supported the United States after, after September um, 11th, 2001 in Afghanistan and Iraq. Again, I think it was an attempt to play a global role. And the present government is, I think, continuing to search for that global role, certainly in its rhetoric, but also 
in its policies. And I think what we're going to see, if I may make any prediction for the future, is a continued search for some sort of global role. There will, I think, be, again, that research, that, that search for others to work with. Um, there has been a talk, of course, among especially those who supported leave, of somehow a renewed Anglosphere, an Anglosphere in which Britain will take a leading role made up of those countries around the world that will speak English. There has been a rummaging through history to find reasons to explain the particular role that Britain has in the world. Um, Britain is exceptional, it's argued. It was never defeated. Um, it hasn't been occupied since 1066. It won the Second World War. It has huge strength in science and technology. It has democracy. It has wonderful institutions. Um, it has not had, as Margaret Thatcher mistakenly told um, Mitterrand of France, revolutions and rebellions like other countries have done. Um, she conveniently missed out the English Civil War of, of the 17th century. There is, too, I think, a huge nostalgia for the Second World War. And again, I think it's something that has been played upon among those who wanted leave. There is con con uh, congruent with that a, a Churchill cult, um, Churchill as the great statesman um, who had a global vision and promoted a global Britain. And you can see it, I think, in, in a lot of the language and policies of the government. The 2021 Integrated Defense and Security Review laid out what it called a vision for global Britain. And it, this includes, I'll just finish by quoting this, an emphasis on openness as a source of prosperity, a more robust position on security and resilience, a renewed commitment to the UK as a force for good in the world, and increased determination to seek multilateral solutions to challenges like climate change. A common theme is that Britain is both a leader and a hub. When the Prime Minister introduced the Integrated Defence and Security Review to the House of Commons this past March, he talked about how we must have, or Britain must have, strength of purpose at home and abroad, how the Union must be reinforced, how Britain's place as a science superpower and a hub of innovation and research must be secured. He talked again about the special relationship and what we're seeing at the moment, and I think what we're going to see in the next few years is reality again calling into question some of that vision. It's not been all that easy to make the trade deals that were promised. The British government has just announced very sharp cuts to aid spending, which are being challenged in the House of Commons, I think today, and I'm, I'm perhaps someone can tell me what happened. And so I think what we're going to see is a Britain, the United Kingdom, that will, of course, continue to have global networks, will continue to be involved and engage in the world but perhaps will be overshadowed by the memories of a different sort of global Britain and an appeal to nostalgia, which I think on the whole will not serve it very well, but it will be something to watch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. That was an absolutely fitting um, paper. And I think that offered something for all of us, whether we were um, sitting here because we're interested in the past, the present or the future. I think that was very rich and very illuminating. So I'm going to remind our audience that we're taking our questions in through the Q&A function and I can see things are coming in already. And whilst people compose their thoughts, I'm just going to sneak in and ask you a question myself, um, Margaret, if I may. I suppose my interest, I, I come to it from a, um, a historical perspective. Um, and I love everything you're saying about our experience of empire over the course of the 19th century. And I think the really striking thing about our particular history is we have we go from being in the 18th century and earlier just a very small, a very small and insignificant nation to suddenly and quite rapidly, certainly in historical terms, becoming a really large global player through the 19th century and becoming much richer than our European neighbours, which we had not been before being demonstrably stronger and wealthier and more industrialized, more modern in many ways, for this little brief window. And then there's a, a long tail, a kind of a decline that's very apparent by the 19th century and a big long 20th century story of decline relative to other parts of the globe. And I suppose I'd just love to push you a little bit more on how you feel that kind of unique, that kind of relatively unique experience of, of greatness and decline in, in, in historical, the very short window of time 
how that bears on the debates around Brexit and, and, and maybe just the fact that unlike most of our European nations, you know, there's, there's lots of there's lots of Euroscepticism across Europe, unlike many other European nations, we've actually now exited from the Union and we're, you know, once again showing ourselves to be slightly different from um, many of our European neighbours. And I would just love to hear more about the links between uh, that, that, that history that we have and these events of the past few years. It is fascinating, isn't it, how what is actually a relatively short period in Britain's history, I mean, if you, if you take it from the sort of flourishing of the first Industrial Revolution, say 1830s, 1840s, to really the First World War, it's not a very long period, but I think it's become fixed in the memory at least of certain peoples in Britain as the norm, that this is what Britain was, that Britain was a global power, that that is what was usual. And of course, if you look back before that, I think, of course, the pattern was very different. And, and you know, the, the I mean, I didn't go into, but, um, you know, the, the British Isles were by no means united. Um, and indeed, England, for much of its history, was, was worried about a hostile Scotland, worried about invasion from the continent, and dealing, particularly, of course, from the Elizabethan period onward, the Tudor period onwards, with a, a situation in Ireland. Um, in many ways, the British got their practice in, in setting up empires in Ireland. Um, we always forget that the British Empire really started uh, right here in the British Isles. Um, and it was not a secure and prosperous country. You're quite right. I mean, it was it depended very much on its trade. It was very much on the fringes of Europe. Um, true, it did have this capacity which developed to move out into the world. But you don't move out into the world, I think, often if, if you're comfortable at home. And the British, in a way, became explorers and became traders because they were looking for something better, much, much, as, much as the Netherlands did and much as the Portuguese did. Um, you know, countries that are rich and, and producing what they need at home, I think, feel less pressure to move out. But it is, I think, important in, in British thinking about themselves today that the 19th century seems to overshadow so much of what is happening. And it's even cast a light backwards. I remember having arguments during the whole referendum debate with people saying, well, we'll go back to the Elizabethan age, that glorious age of conquest and exploration. And I said, it wasn't so glorious. I mean, you were spending so much time worrying about being invaded, you know, and those wonderful explorers were many of them simply pirates. I mean, they were thugs who were going out to do whatever they were doing. So I think you know, that, that history can leave a real burden and it can shape the way you think. And, and perhaps not always quite realistically that you know, too many people have fixed on the 19th century as the norm, to go back to your question, and not recognize that British history has had many different patterns over the centuries and, and has gone through many iterations. Thank you, Margaret. The questions are coming in thick and fast. So although I'd love to sit here and have a conversation with you about this, I'm going to turn over to the questions that are coming in. So John Newham has started us off with, will global Britain help or hinder those seeking the breakup of the UK? Um, I think global Britain may help. If you're thinking of, of those who want to break up the UK in Scotland and, and Wales, I think global global Britain will probably speed that process rather than thing. I don't think the notion of a global Britain is shared that much in Scotland and Wales. It, it Quite frankly, it seems more like a global England vision. And I think the prospect is that certainly in Scotland, where a majority of people voted to remain, um, if Scotland were to become independent, um, the idea that it could rejoin the European Union, turn back towards the continent would be, I think, stronger than some sense of, of global Scotland. And I think the same may be true in the case of Ireland. I mean, I've been surprised by how the prospect or the possibility of the two islands now reuniting is actually one that people talk about as something that is quite serious. I never thought I'd hear it in my lifetime, but you were actually getting people saying, you know, it may well happen, but I think it would happen very much in a European context. I, I suspect, and I please correct me, I mean, maybe those who know more than I do about this, that the idea of a global Britain is really an English global Britain more than, than a United Kingdom global Britain. And indeed, it's not clear the United Kingdom is going to survive. No, very far from clear. Um, Timothy Burt, if global Britain um, only came into popular usage in 2011, was it deliberately seeded as a precursor to support the Brexit campaign? Um, 
it's a fascinating question I don't know. I mean, I've been wondering why it begins to take off just at that point. And, you know, we, 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 I have to assume that Ngram is, is reliable. It may not be, but I mean, I've, I've used it on other occasions and it, it seems to be quite good at tracking the use of a word and it draws on a very big database. I just looked at the English language database, but it may be because that, you know, that the, the, the ideas of, of UKIP and, and the others who want to leave were becoming more and more pronounced. They were gaining seats. Um, the European, the, the, you know, the UKIP members were gaining seats in the European Parliament. So it may simply be that the notion begins to enter the public vocabulary in a way because of what is happening with the increasing prominence of those who are advocating for leave. Um, but your guess is as good as mine. I think it's a fascinating question. It really is, isn't it? Um, Jonathan Jones has asked, is the UK's proneness to delusions of grandeur and British exceptionalism an affliction of all the British or just the English? Well, again, I think it's very much um, depends on your class and on where you live, I think. I mean, I think although the Scots benefited, many of them enormously from the British Empire and, and often staffed the empire and, and you know, in many cases, Scottish jute merchants, for example, made fortunes in India. It was, I think, always seen as more of an English empire run run out of Whitehall, run out of London. Um, the Scots and the Welsh actually tried to get their own colonies in, in a way to try, I think, and, and establish themselves as, as independent, more independent. But I think it probably has been English, but not everyone in England has been caught by the glamour of empire. I mean, a lot of people didn't really care much about it. I think there was a brief period before the First World War when the term jingoism came into vogue and there was a brief sort of fashion for um, matchboxes and, and cigarette cards with heroes of empires on them and boys and girls magazines about the glories of empire. But that, I think, was not a long lived period. And I think for the most part, those who saw the glamour of empire tended to be those from the upper classes, those who had um, ancestors or family who'd gone out and worked in the empire and, and and who wanted to think that they were part of an important and powerful Britain. I think probably it was less appealing always among the working classes, uh, even the middle classes. Yeah, thank you. So um, Ian Harvey has asked, which sentiment do you feel is more accurate a representation of British opinion today? Eulogising global Britain or the view that a citizen of the world is a citizen of nowhere? Oh, yes, that this is such an interesting debate, isn't it? Um, I mean, I've always felt it poses a false polarity. I think you can be a citizen of somewhere and also feel an affinity for a larger world. And I, I think we can have, and, and many of us do have multiple identities. I'm, I'm a citizen of Canada, um, but I still feel part sometimes of a wider world. And so I'm not sure that there, there, is, there is a necessary opposition between these two. But I do think um, there are those who can move more easily around a global world. And I think it depends on your level of education. It depends on connections. It depends on what skills you have. And there are those who would find it more difficult to move, um, partly because of immigration issues, partly because of skills issues. And I think one of the things we've seen, um, both with the referendum result here and also with the election of President Trump in the United States, is a sense among a lot of people that, you know, in this globalized world in which we've been living since the beginning of the 1990s, not everyone has done very well. And it's all very well for, you know, the high flyers to pick up and, and pop over to Hong Kong or whatever, as, as they were doing before COVID. And it's all very well for people to transport their skills around the world, but not everyone can do it. And I think there has been, and, and um, Theresa May, I think rather unfortunately, described such people as the left behind, which I think is an unfortunate epithet, but it, she did fit on, hit on something that there are those who have not benefited from globalization and their skills are no longer needed because there's been so much offshoring of, of production and, and other types of activities. And I think we've got to recognize that globalization, and there are many kinds of globalizations, but the particular globalization which we've been living through in the past decades has caused really serious social and economic problems that we have to deal with. And we have to be concerned for those and those communities which have really suffered. Uh, uh, very true. I think a wake up for all of us, really, when the um, Brexit referendum went the way it did. Um, definitely. Um, John Scrine has asked, what might it take to finally kill 
the deluge of British exceptionalism held by many on the right of politics? Um, delusions will persist for a long time in the face of reality. And I sometimes think, I mean, I can say this coming from a country which doesn't have a glorious past. I mean, you know, we've never conquered anything um, except our own indigenous peoples, and that's another issue. But we have never been a great military power. We've never been a great sort of international power. And therefore, I think we have less burden from the past. We're not trying to live up to something. But I think of the French. You know, I think of how much French foreign policy, even today, is affected by the fact that they were the country of Louis XIV and they were the country of Napoleon and they dominated Europe um, for a couple of centuries. And I think you see it in many of the attitudes of President Macron. And I think you see it again with President Putin, who refers really quite often to Peter the Great and the past glories of the Russian past. And I think in the case of Britain, you know, I think this, this nostalgia, I, I suppose is the word for it, and this, 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 this enthusiasm for the glories of the past runs, runs deep. It can be very strong. I think reality will intrude. But as we know, people are very good. We're very good at explaining away reality. Um, you know, I had an argument with someone, um, politely, I hope, um, about what would happen when Britain became out of when Britain got out of the European Union. And, and this was a Leave supporter. And he said, oh, well, the, the Canadians and the Australians and others will become part of the Anglosphere. All those ties will be resurrected. They will follow our lead. And I said, I don't think so. You know, we've moved on. We're different. Um, you know, I don't, but you know, this was a, a strong conviction and there was very little I could say to disabuse him of this idea. So I think we, sh we will be, I think, surprised by how long beliefs will last, even in the face of evidence to the contrary. Yes, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to go on to Eileen Coates's question and she asks, beyond the rhetoric and speechifying, just how important was Churchill? That is, of course, a, a fascinating question. And I think in a way it's unfortunate that Churchill's very real political and, and, and other contributions have been overshadowed by the sort of glorification of Churchill. Um, now there is a Churchill cult, um, funnily enough, even more strongly pronounced in the United States and Canada than the United Kingdom. But what that means is Churchill is increasingly seen as someone who's never wrong. And of course we know that he was often wrong. I mean, his career was marked by mistakes, um, you know, from Gallipoli onwards. I mean, he, he wasn't always right. Um, some of his ideas during the Second World War, I mean, yes, I think his great moment was 1940 when he, he decided that Britain should remain in the war and not try to come to terms with Hitler. I've always thought he made the right decision on that. But he made many mistakes in the course of the war. And he nearly drove his generals to distraction with, you know, completely impossible strategic suggestions. And I think, you know, he made, mis I would argue, he made a mistake in his attitude towards India. Um, there was, I think, um, certainly a racist element in that. But more than that, he, he failed to recognize the force of Indian nationalism. He failed to recognize that India was moving to, to self-government. The Indians were gaining more experience in, in ruling themselves. He opposed Indian independence, I think, in, in a very, very... Um, reactionary way. But I think it is unfortunate that this is not discussed. Um, or if it is discussed, um, it goes to the other extreme. And so you get people who say Churchill was completely dreadful in all ways, which I don't think is, is true either. I mean, I think Churchill, the man, a complicated man, a complicated politician who made many mistakes and did some good things, is somehow being lost in all this. And I think that's very unfortunate. Um, I think we need to consider him as we would consider other political leaders and recognize that he was a man of his times and a complicated person who was a mix as we all are of, of many different things. Yeah, thank you. Um, Amit Pan has asked, um, Britain might be said to be less united internally than at any time since the early 17th century. Does this doom any pretensions to a significant global role? Well, I do wonder, um, you know, I think those outside Britain are aware of the divisions. I mean, certainly, you know, I, I speak to a lot of people in Canada, I'm in the UK at the moment, but I'm constantly in touch with people in Canada and people there are very aware of, of the strengths of Scottish nationalism, um, wondering what's going to happen with Ireland. You know, I think, I think the sort of reassurance, I mean, the prime minister is very good at presenting a very positive view. You know, we're going to, you know, Britain is on the slipway. We're going to, you know, 
move into the world where we're going to be stronger and more united than ever. But again, the reality doesn't entirely bear this up. And I think the great confidence with which the government or many people in the government have talked about all the wonderful trade deals they're going to do, um, you know, how this is just going to be so easy. When you begin to look at these trade deals, um, you know, they're not as good as they might be. I mean, the Norwegian one um, is not as good as Britain had when it was when it was in the European Union. They've done a trade deal with Canada, which was was tricky to negotiate because the Canadians spent a lot of time. We spent a lot of time negotiating trade deals. And, you know, there was a lot of talk about this is going to be great. And the Canadians have now said that they haven't quite finished on the dairy products negotiations. And we have a highly protected dairy industry and all the sort of breezy statements from the UK government about how, you know, Canadians are going to be eating Stilton cheese and Cheshire cheese. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, you know, so I think that there's a lot of optimism, but I think it's misplaced. I mean, it's, it's not an easy world out there in their countries which are going to protect their own interests. And the trade deal with Australia is when you look at the details, um, it opens up British markets to mass produced Australian food, which is, is going to hurt British farmers. And what's more, more worrying, I think, it's a precedent for American trade deals over food. I mean, the American agricultural producers, mostly very large producers, are longing to be able to get their products into the United Kingdom, and that will undercut British food producers. And it may challenge British notions of, of um, health and safety, of hygiene, of um, how you manage these, these products, because the Americans have a very different way of dealing with meat products, for example, than the British do. And so I think the British are going to find themselves negotiating with very tough negotiators who have a lot of leverage and of course they no longer have the protection that they had when they were in the European Union. I think you're very right and I think these products are not always interchangeable. Somebody wants to eat Rockfort doesn't necessarily want to eat Stilton. Yeah. Um, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of naivety in the debates around food that don't uh, fully seem to grasp the kind of the, the deeply cultural nature of what we eat as well. Um, Amit, apologies, your full name didn't appear up on the screen there. Amit Pandia, that question came from. Our next question is from Geoffrey Harris. If the British people ever realise that global Britain is an illusion, what could they do about it? The current post-Brexit debate is actually hampered by pro-EU schadenfreude. How about in 10 or 20 years time? How can this illusion last? Can Britain ever find its role without looking for one? It's, I think, going to be a complicated discussion in the United Kingdom. And, and I think what's been unfortunate, I think, about the referendum and the subsequent years is that it has left the divisions deeper. Um, I may be wrong, but it seems to me the divisions are deeper than they were um, before the referendum, that the positions have hardened. And although there still is a degree of civility in Britain, much more, I would say, than the United States between Republicans and Democrats, um, I think I do see people sort of tending to, to move into circles where they only talk to people who agree with them, which I think is not good for the cohesion of the country. And I think there is a debate, and there always has been, I mean, this was the debate that took place after, after the Second World War, about is Britain stronger by being part of multilateral organizations and influencing them from within or can it go it alone and the examples and the times when britain tried to go it alone after 1945 are not very encouraging ones um you know suez um in a way britain tried to go it, go it alone and, and that was i think really a a, a, a wake-up moment when the british realized they no longer had the influence and power in in the middle east for example that they thought they would have and so I think it's going to be a difficult set of discussions. And it's going to be difficult, I think, if we end up with an England, possibly with Wales, because I think the Welsh would find it more difficult to leave and, and contemplate independence. But what if Scotland does vote for independence and then rejoins the European Union? I mean, these are what ifs, but they're not improbabilities. And I think the same thing with Northern Ireland. Um, you know, I mean, the situation, I think, in Northern Ireland is extremely worrying, and I think the tensions that have been rising are very, very concerning. But it may be that with successive generations that those tensions will somehow be accommodated and that Northern Ireland will see an advantage in moving to greater unity with the Republic of Ireland, um, which will leave a smaller political unit than the United Kingdom of today. And 
what leverage will it have? I mean, I think you, you always need to ask this question, how can you influence others to, to work with you? How can you influence others to do deals with you? And I think, you know, although Britain has spent, the United Kingdom has spent um, a higher proportion of its GDP on, on defense, for example, than most other European countries with the exception of France, I think, although it has until recently spent a higher proportion of its GDP on, on international aid, will it be able to sustain that? And will it want to sustain it? So I think there are a great many question marks. I mean, I, I don't want to be too gloomy because I think the United Kingdom brings great advantages. And I think the very um, strength of its political institutions and, and the openness of its society is a great political advantage. But it has to be, I think, part of other sorts of things, including economic power and, and the power to deal with those you want to deal with around the world. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Andrew Ferran has put in our next question. Can a comprehensive trade visa agreement between the UK and Canada, New Zealand or Australia be achieved? Thinking along the lines of the Irish-British visa agreement. I think we already actually have um, a fairly workable um, visa agreement. Um, people from, I think it's still the case, certainly from Canada and I think the case with Australia and New Zealand can come to the UK for six months um, without visas. Um, and so movement of, of populations is, is fairly easier. And it has been the case, I think, that I don't know if I think it's still operable, certainly it is between Canada and, and Australia, that young people can get working visas for, I think, up to three years to work in each other's countries. I mean, of course, COVID has suspended all this. And I think it's been the same with the United Kingdom. Whether we can get something more comprehensive I think will be difficult. I mean, Canada, Australia, New Zealand all have their own well-established um, visa regimes and they all have their, their own systems. And we have over the years become very selective about who we let in. Um, you know, when I was growing up, it used to be that anyone from British Isles could move to Canada. Now we have a very rigorous point system, which in fact the um, British government, I think, has, has, has in many ways been adopting. And to become an immigrant to Canada, you have to fill certain qualifications, speak one of the two official languages, have certain skills, um, age also helps. And I can't see the Canadians abandoning that. And as far as comprehensive trade deals go, um, you know, we have become, I mean, I think that the countries you're talking about, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, were very shocked when the British applied to jo join the common market in the 1960s and then again in the 1970s. Um, we'd had very little warning of it, and up to that point, a lot of our trade had been with Britain. But once Britain joined the European Union, our trade patterns began to shift. And although we still have a certain amount of trade with the British Isles, increasingly in the case of Canada, we try to trade with the United States and Asia. And of course, Australia and New Zealand are also trading more and more with Asia. So how willing those countries will be to do a comprehensive trade deal with, with Britain, I think, will be interesting. And we can, I, I mean, you know, with Canadians are often seen as nice. We're actually very tough in trade negotiations. Um, we've had to be, and we have a great many full-time trade negotiators, um, far more than Britain had when it voted to leave the European Union. And so we have a lot of experience at this. And of course, there's also the fact of geography, um, you know, that it is, uh, the distances are long. Um, it's easier to travel with those who are close at hand. So. I think we'll have trade deals, we may well do immigration deals, but a big sort of comprehensive package, I would be surprised, quite frankly. Fascinating, thank you. Um, Kathleen Lane has put a question in, does the British press nowadays play a greater role in perpetuating the ideas, delusions regarding Britain's role in the world than the press of the 1920s to the 1940s? I think perhaps there's less range of opinions in the press. Um, you know, six out of the seven major newspapers, um, for example, at the time of the referendum were in favor of leaving the EU. I think it was only the Guardian um, and possibly the Financial Times that, that made the case for Remain. And so I think on certain issues, you perhaps do have um, a heavier preponderance of, of the press um, promoting certain attitudes. And of course, there are fewer national newspapers than there used to be. But I think, you know, the press, has always particularly, I think, not, not the popular press, but also the quality press, has always had its own particular views of what, what Britain will be. And a great deal of the, of the jingoistic supporting of empire in the period before the First World War and after 
was reflected in the press, you know, that we are the center of a great nation, a great, a great empire and, and so on. Um, so I'm not sure it's that much different. I think there's less variety today and that I think is, is unfortunate. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a few, um, maybe another 10 minutes or so to run. So if anybody has any questions that they want to pose to Margaret, do uh, by all means make the most of it to use the Q&A function and to write something in there. But Margaret, as we've got a, a pause, I'll just, uh, I'd love to come back and ask you, pick up on something that you were talking about a little earlier, Grant. Now I know as historians, we're, our business is looking back rather than looking forwards. Um, but I wonder what your thoughts are about looking forward. I'm thinking in particular about the, the, the United Kingdom, the relationships between England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And if you feel uh, what kind of stresses and stress, pressures and strains we are, that, that union is going to be put under through the events of the yeah. last few years and, and what future you see there. Well, it has been put under stress. Um, and I think that's become very clear. And I think there is a feeling rightly or wrongly that far too much is, is decided out of London and that London is too powerful economically and, and culturally. And I think the present government, as other governments have been, is very much aware of this. I mean, one of the impetuses behind um, Boris Johnson's talk of leveling up has been to try and uh, deal in some ways with those parts of the country which, which feel um, that they have been neglected or, or left out. And the fact that so many Tory MPs now come from the former Labour seats in the North mean that I think the government is going to have to pay more attention to the North. But I find it very difficult to imagine how this government, a Tory government, is, is going to make much headway in talking to the Scots. Um, I mean, the Conservative Party in Scotland is, is you know, not, I think, going to challenge the, the SNP. I mean, it is possible if the three opposition parties um, in uh, three or four opposition parties in Scotland could get together, they could challenge the SNP, but the likelihood of them doing that, I think, is very uh, imp improbable indeed. And difficult to tell. I mean, you know, the, the polls seem to show still, and as far as I remember, a slight majority of Scots in favor of remaining in the union. But how strong those feelings are, of course, is, is another matter. And it wouldn't take much, it seems to me, um, to, to increase that sense that, you know, we're being neglected, they don't care about us. Um, you know, there's talk now of, of sending um, uh, the Duke of Cambridge, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge to spend more time in Scotland to, to make a home at Balmoral. Will that make much difference? I, I don't know. Many Scots may feel that it's too, too little too late. And so difficult to tell, I think, um, what will happen. What I think is important is, is what the European Union will do, because the European Union doesn't have to take an independent Scotland in. Scotland would have to reapply. And it may be, certainly it used to be the case that many in the European Union didn't want to encourage separatism in Scotland because they were afraid it would encourage the same sort of sentiments in Catalonia and elsewhere. But it may be that the European Union will now say if Scotland becomes independent, it would be foolish not to. Um, you know, I come from a federal country and we've had our own separatist issues, but I tend to think that if you can accommodate them, um, being part of a larger political group actually makes a sort of sense. I mean, in some ways it seems, you know, you look at these islands, they're not that big. Um, the prospect that they would go back to what they were at the beginning of the, of the six, 16th century, three, three separate states, um, or possibly four, seems rather silly. Um, you know, when, when the links, the communications, the roads, you know, the, the, the ways of thinking are, are so aligned. Um, but, you know, there are those who want to separate who will tell me I'm quite wrong. No, I mean, it's curious. I mean, compared to a country the size of Canada, um, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're one state, aren't we? We're nothing, but um, yeah, fascinating. Um, Amit Pandya has put in another question. Had the Entente not been blinded by racism and had they treated Japan as an equal in creating post-World War I order, might the subsequent course of Pacific and Asian history have been different? It's always possible, I think. I mean, I think the Japanese tried, or certainly the elements in, in the Japanese leadership tried very hard, and I think they were supported by a lot of the population, to become part of a liberal international order after 1919, after the end of the First World War. And a lot of Japanese were committed to the idea of a League of Nations. I mean, you know, I think, again, the history of Japan in the 30s and 40s tends to overshadow what was, in fact, um, a very lively and open society 
um, before about 1930 with, with a great many different political opinions. And I think there were a lot of Japanese who sincerely believed in trying to build a different sort of order, who sincerely believed the Wilsonian principles. But the fact that um, the white powers, so-called, continued, I think, in a way to treat them as inferiors, and I think crucially continued to prevent their citizens from emigrating to places like Australia, um, the west coast of the United States. So there were discriminatory laws on also in uh, the western Canadian provinces, um, I think did begin to turn a lot of Japanese against the idea of cooperating with the great European powers in the United States. I mean, a number of Japanese said they'll always treat us as inferiors, and I think there was something in that. And the Japanese also increasingly argued that they needed an empire. I mean, they were concerned about the growth of their own population. They were concerned that they couldn't produce everything they needed to sustain themselves or to sustain their industries. Um, they wanted the resources of an empire. And when they looked at China, where they'd already established a foothold, um, they, they, they argued that they should be able to expand into China. And they saw it as rank hypocrisy on the part of, of the European powers in the United States to say that they should leave China alone. And as they pointed out, the European powers had expanded their empires and hadn't left parts of the world alone. Why should they not be able to do so as well? And so I think it's possible if the Western powers had treated Japan differently, um, yes, I think things might have, might have been different. But once Japan fell increasingly under the domination of the, of the militarists, um, then I think it was set on a collision course. They were determined, I think, to um, extend their empire in China, even at the cost of alienating the European powers and the United States. Um, yes, it's probably a missed opportunity, um, like many things in history. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Robert Lind has asked, will we ever escape the gravitational pull of the EU, or are we destined to revisit the Brexit debate again and again? I'm sure you'll agree it's a lovely question. I think you will revisit it. Um, I think it was revisited the day the referendum was announced, quite frankly. Um, you know, so much of your trade goes to the European Union. And it's not just that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, well, again, let me just give you a Canadian um, sort of perspective on this. When you're in Britain, people talk about going to Europe. When you're in Canada, we talk about going to Europe and we include Britain. You know, the further away you get, the more you're aware of what unites the British Isles and the continent. Um, you know, as I said, and the channel is sometimes seen as a barrier, but I think it can equally with justification be seen as, as a channel, as a, as a, as a highway, as, as a means of, as a bridge, as, as a means of back and forth, as it always has been, um, you know, down through, through most recorded history, a means of communication and trade and, and investment between the continent of Europe and these islands. And if you look at the, the culture, if you look at the values, if you look at the buildings, I mean, you know, the, 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 the cathedrals, the, the castles, um, you know, the arts, um, the ideas, these have gone back and forth across the channel. And so the further away you go, and certainly from the Canadian perspective, from the other side of the Atlantic, and I think Americans see the same, Britain is part of Europe. And the EU, EU is, is an institution within Europe, but it's not all of Europe. But the idea that Britain is somehow different from Europe, that it's not European, this seems to me, again, I see it from outside, seems to me really implausible. Um, it is part of Europe and it's been heavily influenced by Europe. I mean, I've always thought one of the great ironies that the leader of, of um, UKIP was someone called Nigel Farage, whose ancestors were Huguenots. I mean, just one small example of the exchange of populations and ideas that has gone on for centuries. So I think, yes, um, I think the, the nature of the relationship with Europe, which, as I say, encompasses far more than the European Union, but with the European Union itself, because the European Union is, is a key part of what it is to be Europe, is something that is going to go on. And I think there will be people saying, you know, as we try and get trade deals with them, why are we not just looking at something like a comprehensive trade agreement? Um, why, why are we, you know, why are we, we sort of hurt, hitting ourselves um, by making this more difficult for ourselves? You know, we're, we're getting worse trade deals than we had. Um, you know, on some things, of course, we want to align with the European Union. We, we may see Brussels as fussy and irritating, but do we really want to have very different standards in, in food hygiene? Do we really want to have very different standards in the productions of medicines? Do we really want to have very different standards? in the um, treatment of criminals. And I would say, you know, on so many things, what people here in these islands want to do, 
um, is, is very close to what people on the continent of Europe want to do. What worries me, and I may be wrong, but I'm just hope that there'll be a European Union to negotiate with in 30 years. You know, Britain's withdrawal has weakened it. Um, it's dealing with, I think, very serious problems over in the East. Um, in, in Hungary and Poland, you have countries which are not really abiding by the European values, which the European Union made a condition, the, the democratic values of, of entry. So I think there are real problems within the EU. And, and of course, it has pressure from outside, pressure from Russia. Um, Putin sees the EU as, as a foe and, and would dearly love to disrupt it. And the Chinese will, as they push more and more into the world, try and, and influence what they see as, as the weaker members of the European Union, try and put pressure on it. So let's hope that there is. I at least, well, you know, I, I think I've made my views clear. I, th I think it's a shame you left. Um, but if you want to reestablish a relationship, I hope there's something to reestablish a relationship with. Thank you. Uh, one more question from a historian that picks up actually on some of the things that you've just um, veered towards there. What role did the 2008 global financial crisis play in the rise of nationalism we are today seeing in the US, the UK and Hungary, for example? I think the 2008 crisis was important. Um, I think it shook people's faith in not just the financial and international financial institutions and international agreements um, that were meant to prevent such things from happening, but I think it also shook people's faith in their own leadership. Um, how could they not have noticed that this was happening? I mean, there certainly had been lots of warnings and a lot of people, of course, suffered. Um, you know, the world made a recovery, but that didn't mean that everyone recovered. And a lot of people lost their homes, a lot of people lost their savings. But I think perhaps equally important have been the longer term effects of globalization. Um, this sense that globalization has made a lot of people very rich and depressed the wages and living standards of a lot of other people and has thrown people out of jobs, leaving them only with um, get the gig economy where they do two or three part-time jobs with no security, where they don't um, see any ways of, of developing their skills. And so I think it's not just the financial crisis of 2008, which is certainly a, a warning sign, but it's also the, the, the effects of globalization, um, the rapid globalization. And I think the COVID pandemic may increase this, um, you know, that again, I think people are asking, where were our leaders? Why, why have they not dealt with this all that well? And I think what we're seeing, we, yeah, we're seeing not populism. I think luckily um, a lot of populists got themselves into governments and, and, and you know, the, the problem populists already always have is they're very good at attacking and they're very good at blaming and they're very good at saying, you know, the whole system is rotten. And when they get into power, they then have to do something and they're not necessarily very good at that. You know, the Liga Norde in Italy um, or the Cinque Stelle, um, when it actually got into government was, was pretty hopeless. And so I think that kind of populism has suffered a setback, but I think we may well see a renewed nationalism. And unfortunately, the sort of COVID nationalism, the hoarding of vaccines, the trying to blame of others, I think has, has really fueled that. So, you know, I think we're in for, you know, we're in for a bit of a, a turbulent time, I think. Uh, I think so very much, Margaret. Um, I think I'm going to, we've got no more questions coming in. We're just almost five to, so it's probably time for us to draw to a close. Margaret, I would love to thank you. I'm sorry we're not here in person and I can't, um, uh, can't communicate with you in the way I would normally do, but that was a really fascinating and wide ranging paper that I think we have all really enjoyed on this Tuesday evening. I'd love to thank the audience as well. I think there's a um, range of questions there um, and the deafness with which uh, Margaret has answered them has been really absolutely uh, fascinating to behold. And I'd also, of course, love to thank Hussein for organising such a wide ranging series of events. Um, and really, we owe him a big debt. Before I go, I'd also love to um, remind everybody that this event, this, this series is running again in a fortnight's time on Tuesday, the 22nd of June. Our speaker on this occasion will be Dominic Grieve, QCPC, president of the European Movement, a former Conservative politician, of course, an opponent of Brexit at the time of the 2016 referendum, and certainly a very central figure in the Brexit negotiation subsequently. He's going to be speaking on Brexit, revolution without end, or a stable future. And you can book by visiting the link, which is going to be posted into the chat. The recording of tonight's event will be available for playback on YouTube uh, at a later date. 
Um, and in the meantime, all it is left for me to do is to wish everybody a warm, pleasant summer's Tuesday evening and to thank Margaret once again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. And thanks for all the questions.